Tom Cronin. Welcome to the podcast. It's great to be here. Mate, looking forward to talking all things, the portal, meditation, stillness, and everything in between. But before we get started, can you give the guys a 90 second to two minute spiel about your world, your life, and what's got you to where you are now? Yeah, gosh, that's a lot to compress. But uh, I was a broker in finance, uh, was kind of crazy wolf of Wall Street. That kind of got me very much out of control. A lot of uh, distortions in my state, you know, a lot of anxiety, depression, panic attacks. Um, you know, that led me down Western medicine with doctors, psychiatrists, psychologists, pharmaceuticals. But uh, I just really felt that wasn't quite the right path for me. And that's when I came across meditation, gosh, going back 26 years ago now. And that was a real game changer for me. I came across transcendental meditation or Vedic meditation now, and it really just completely changed my life in a big way. But I stayed on in the industry for quite a long time, another 16 more years, just using meditation as a tool to help me become really successful. Uh, built, you know, a lot of property and uh, was, you know, just loved being in finance and doing that. But eventually I just realized that it was time for me to leave that and then Michelle left finance and now I teach meditation. I produced a film, have six books out. I work with some of the top companies like Amazon, Coca-Cola, Union Bank of Switzerland. And yeah, do a lot of coaching, helping people to, I guess, kind of follow a little bit in my footsteps, you know, to get their businesses scaled and get some structure and some format to it and some scale to what they're doing as well. What was the catalyst for you? You obviously spoke about anxiety, stress, um, I guess you kind of mental challenge as well. What was the the pinnacle or the moment where you decided that the way you were doing things might not have been working for you and that you explored meditation part one part two what was the catalyst for you finally leaving that world yeah you know it's um there's two sort of steps to that one was when i learned to meditate and, and you know it's not like you sort of think oh, i don't think things are working for me well i need to change them it's really just i i have this horrible pain point which was anxiety panic mm -hmm. attacks depression insomnia things were pretty dark and so i was really you know, it's, we, we usually change things in our life because of the carrot or the stick. Um, you know, some of my clients come to me because they want to be more enlightened. That's the carrot. You know, they're looking to move towards something that's more charming and more alluring or move away from something that's very painful. So for me, I was trying to move away from something that was painful and that was the stick. So I needed to find a way to get rid of this pain. And that's when I discovered meditation. It was actually on TV. Uh, some guy who was a very famous property developer was talking about, his success, but there was a tiny slit of that story, how he used meditation for his success. And so that's what triggered me to start looking into that. And as a result of me learning to meditate, all of those things just simply melted away. Uh, it was really quite phenomenal how quickly it melted those things away. So that was the first step in the process. The second one was when I decided to leave finance and it just became more and more apparent that I was here on this planet for more than what I was doing just to make money in the finance industry. And, sell government bonds and semi-government bonds and inflation swaps to the large investment banks. So um, it became really apparent that there was, I had knowledge and access to something that could really change people's lives. And I could see it was changing a lot of people's lives because I kept referring more and more people to other meditation teachers. And I thought, this is crazy. I just, I need to start learning how to do this myself. And that's when I became a teacher. Now, still at that point, I hadn't decided to leave finance. You know, I had a mortgage, I've got a family of four to feed, and there was a financial um, responsibility that I, I had to sort of be obligated to. But as I started teaching meditation part-time and running retreats part-time, it became more and more apparent that I had to find a way to make this work because this, you know, this was something that I lived and breathed and I had to go into. Do you find um, kind of looking into your work and even what you've said there and the, the type of clientele that you work with and attract, do you find many of them are going through that I guess, identity crisis or potentially looking to shift things that aren't necessarily working for them? And, and where, where does one start? Yeah, you know, I, you know, I've had quite a number of clients, and I'll tell you about one of them, that, you know, ideally, you know, they've got all the boxes ticked in their life. You know, they've got the, the wife and the kids and the, um, the business. You know, there was one guy, he'd sold his business to one of Australia's largest mining companies for $300 million. And he had bought this villa on the Amalfi Coast in Italy. This is an Aussie guy from Paddington, Sydney, and bought this Amalfi, uh, this incredible villa on the Amalfi Coast, had two wonderful kids, lovely wife, married, all the money in the world you could ever possibly poke a stick at. And he reached out to me, I don't know how he got my details, but he reached out to me from Italy, from his villa in the Amalfi Coast, and 
he explained to me that he'd never been more unhappy, more, more anxious than he'd ever been in his life. And you think, how could that possibly be so? And I think this is part of the evolutionary process that we're going through now on the planet is that when we were in what we call outcome oriented fulfillment, we tick boxes trying to achieve and experience a fulfillment that's derived from outcomes, which is where most of the world's at at the moment. If I get this acquisition, if I have this experience, then I'll get more fulfilled. And so that's why Westfield shopping mall is full on a Saturday morning because we're trying to buy our way into fulfillment. We're trying to work our way into fulfillment. We're trying to experience our way into fulfillment. And of course, the universe, it's not the path. And so the universe will give us cues and guidance systems to let us know that we're still ignoring what we're essentially here to do. And so it won't let you almost be fulfilled and complacent and content no matter how much you get, because the illusion will still be there. The ignorance will still be there. It's not until we start exploring the inner world and the world of spirituality that we will truly find true fulfillment. Just so I got that clear, was it outcome fulfillment? I haven't heard that. Is that what you... Outcome-oriented fulfillment. Ah, beautiful. So outcome-oriented fulfillment is acquisitions and, and activities that provide us with levels of fulfillment. Mm. The picnic, the birthday present, the, the new car, the new job, the Bitcoin portfolio, all outcomes are temporary sources of fulfillment. There's a guy called David Brooks who wrote a book um, called The Second Mountain, which I really resonated with. I'm not sure if you've heard it, but no, essentially the first mountain is all around exactly what society follows, the ticking the boxes that society deems and um, a very individualistic look at life and the materialistic and the status and the ego and everything that kind of comes with it. And he sees one of three potential paths. One, you just keep doing that for the rest of your life and you keep chasing the next thing thinking that's the answer. Two is that you have some kind of breakdown or breakthrough, midlife crisis, debt, divorce, deep, disease, death, something like that, and you start reassessing things. Or three, you climb it enough times, look around, realize that it's not necessarily working for you, and then you seek something else, which I'm guessing uh, is a common thread in the work that you do and some of the clientele that you attract. Yeah, absolutely. A lot, a lot of my clients are sort of between 30 and 50, predominantly in their 40s that have ticked most of their boxes. They're quite wealthy, uh, corporate -y, you know, got good family lives, a lot of them, uh, good health, good business, good success. And yet they just find that life's just not working for them. For some reason, they can't work out what it is. You know, this what scratches their head. You know, they're like, I don't get it. You know, I did everything that society told me to do, which is what I got to as well. You know, mm. I, I remember being in Byron, having a holiday with my beautiful wife and, I was curled up in, a, in, in the bed having an anxiety attack, having a panic attack. And I remember trying to list, I'm not trying, I was listing all the, the amazing things that I had in my life and literally everything was what you literally want. I had all of the things you could possibly want in life. And yet there I was suffering from panic attacks and depression. Mm. And, you know, for whatever reason, you know, you could say there was a divine intelligence coming in and saying, nah, you're missing the point here, mate. Mm. It's, it's not about... At the time, I was doing a lot of drugs and drinking and hedonistic type of existence as a Wolf of Wall Street style broker. Um, even though I had acquired all those things you could possibly want in life, but the universe was just trying to guide me. And there's this beautiful paternal, um, or let's just say maternal guidance figure that is overlooking our lives, trying to support and nourish and guide us to a much more fulfilling, a much more harmonious, a much more joyful way of living. It's just that we're very ignorant and very stubborn to hear that message that's coming through. I didn't expect to go down this path, but I'm enjoying it. What did you find was the opening for you into version 2.0 of yourself? And what, what is it that a lot of these um, clients that you work with need to see in order to, because it, it's strong conditioning, really strong conditioning to let that go, especially when you've been on that hedonic treadmill for so long. What is it they need to see or experience that gives them the other path or, or, or a shift? Well, certainly for in my case and why I eventually became a meditation teacher of, of the Vedic tradition was because it has to be experiential. It can't be intellectual. Mm. It can't be conceptual. You know, it can't be a, a thought in the mind. It has to be an experience beyond the thinking of the mind. And that's when this ability to transcend in meditation is so critical. And I just feel so passionate that until we experience Turiya, that fourth state 
of beyond mental, physical, and emotional, beyond your dream state, you beyond a deep sleep state, beyond your thinking state, until we really get a glimpse and stabilize that reality, we're always going to fall short of what it is to be a human. And all of that dogma, all of that coding, all of that conditioning that's led us down that path of illusion and ignorance, it just suddenly just melts away very quickly mm. because we now have direct experience into wisdom, into guidance, into intuition, into all those things that are helping support us be more aligned with natural law, more aligned with the universe, more aligned with a harmonious existence. It doesn't mean you're going to become enlightened and perfect. It's certainly not that. Um, it just means that you're going to find that you can tune in and tap into that source on a daily basis. And that's going to be the source that helps you move more progressively towards a healthier, happier life. When it comes to meditation, the work that you do, why do you think it's important to, for people to meditate daily? And is there an approach that you take initially to people that might be resistant and, and the positioning of meditation as opposed to once they've bought in more and seen it differently? I think there's firstly two main benefits as to why they should meditate twice a day, ideally. One is we have extremely uh, busy lives now. Uh, you know, if we look at the curve of human existence and look at the levels of activity and mental stimulation of human existence um, throughout time, we'll see in the last probably 20 years, if not even last 10 years, an exponential off the chart curve of mental stimulation, physical stimulation and busyness. There's a definitely a quickening that's happening on the planet. And to get reprieve from that is really critical. Otherwise, we're going to just blow up. It's like we reach what's called the bifurcation point in engineering terms where the system overloads. It just can't take the load anymore. And a lot of us are reaching bifurcation point and I reached it at 29, partly because of my lifestyle choices. So that deep rest, that efficient deep rest that happens in the 20 minute of transcending in meditation, it's hard to achieve. And I don't, I don't want to be meditation elitist or have any superiority around meditation. I think all meditation practices are beautiful. Um, I just find that some get you to an experience that others won't get you. And that's mm. that deep level of physiological rest that happens when the mind transcends um, is so efficient and so effective at healing and restoring balance in the body on a regular basis that we really need that minimum once, if not twice a day. So that's the first important thing is just the reset and recalibration of the physical body. The second thing is to transcend. Now, transcendence means to actually get out of the coded, conditioned, habituated mind. You know, we pick up a software code in our mind when we arrive in this world, which is a genetic lineage that you get from your parents. Um, you don't just get the color of your eyes and the shape of your nose and the shape of your mouth which is the hardware, you actually get a software that comes with the hardware and that's your personality traits. Um, you know, all of those things are built into your software that you bring into this world. And then that software keeps getting more and more code put into it through the school that you went to, the society you went to, the religion you were brought up in, the footy team your dad supported, the political party your mum and dad voted for, all of those things are coding our mind with a particular, what's called vasana, a pattern of neurological thought forms. Um, and this pattern is kind of like our operating system. And we think we're free thinkers, but we're not. We're really deeply coded to behave in and think in a particular way based upon all of that conditioning. So when we transcend, what happens is we free ourselves of that. We now access a field of mind that's not the thought field mind. It's actually a conscious mind. And when we start to incorporate more of the conscious mind into our thinking mind, it starts to influence our thinking mind to become more conscious. <laughs> And so now we start to have a thinking mind that's influenced more from wisdom and consciousness than from the code and genetics. The term bifurcation, do I get Bif that right? Bifurcation, which bifurcation. Is something bifurcates, it breaks down or breaks through. How does that, I, I, and I understand kind of exactly where you're going with that, but how does that look and where do you see us potentially going if we can't like mm. reverse it or, or, or change that path? Yeah, we cover that in the film a lot. Um, it's actually on the second page of the book as well. We, we, there's, a, there's a Sanskrit word called Rashi. And we have three forces within the mechanics of evolution at any given time playing out in our lives. We have Brahma, which is the creative operator. We have Vishnu, which is the maintenance operator. And we have Shiva, which is the destructive operator. So these three are always in our relationships, in our health, in our vitality, in our company, in our planet, in our species. There, there's one or more of them at play at any given point in time. And so most of us, ideally, we want to be, in, well, ideally, we all want to be in Brahma dominant. That's creative operator mode. So it's when we're growing, we're learning, we're evolving, and we're 
constantly adapting and changing. But if we try to maintain for too long, then what happens is that maintenance defies evolution. So if iPhone, I always use this as an example. If Apple comes out with a new phone, let's just say the iPhone 10, and that's Brahma, that means they're creating something new. And that's really good for evolution. It means something's evolving, adapting and growing. But if they say, we're not going to put out another phone because we think this is the best phone, that's maintenance. We're going to maintain this as the new status quo, and we're not going to change anything. Hmm. We're going to maintain. Now, you can maintain for a period of time to stabilize the new status quo. That's Vishnu, the maintenance operator. Now, if Apple maintained that ongoing and never changed that, you'd see the company start to corrode and collapse, okay, because they're holding on to a status quo that's not evolving, growing and adapting. And that would mean that Shiva would then come in and start to stir things up and make things uncomfortable. Let's see their share price dropping. Let's see their profits dropping. Let's see Samsung start to take them over. Um, and so that would be Shiva causing turbulence. Shiva's there. Nah, you've got to change. You've got to evolve. You've got to adapt. And it's always that little tap on the shoulder that Shiva's giving us. Now, if Shiva can't do the job and if Shiva is not able to move you from Vishnu into Brahma, then what happens, it's kind of like call in the Rashi. We need a bigger force than Shiva. Now, what happens when the Rashi comes in? This is the bifurcation point. You hit a fork in the road. Now, in a fork in the road, you can't continue on on the current trajectory. You must deviate one way or the other. The current trajectory is unsustainable. So at that point, that's the bifurcation point. That's where things go break down or break through. Mm. You get to choose one or the other. So the relationship will go into divorce or go to the next level. The company will go into bankruptcy or go to the next level. The civilization, the Mayans, Aztecs, or Easter Islanders will, will go into annihilation or they'll go to the next level. And so what we're seeing on the planet is this movement towards the edge of the cliff, which is a breakdown or breakthrough. It could see human civilization self-terminate, which is a high probability, or it could see humans go into an enlightened state of consciousness, which is a whole other level, which is also a high probability as well. It's the two very different worlds. Um, <laughs> very different I'm, worlds, guess, I'm guessing the... Both of them the, are good for the planet, though. So how do you see... Because the... evolution is only good. Don't forget that. Evolution mm. is never bad. The process of evolution is brutal sometimes, if it has to be. But evolution itself is never bad. So how would you see those potential two pole opposites um, unfolding, let's say, over the next five to 25 years? What, what could that potentially look like based on where we're at? Yeah, so next five to 25 years, we won't see annihilation of the planet. I don't think anyway. The possibilities, and I've, I've spent some time in long conversations with people that manage extremely large, multi, multi billion dollar venture capital funds that are investing purely in existential risk to humanity. And they see four to five pillars of potential risk to human existence. One is nuclear, one is environmental. One is obviously food shortages. One is, uh, what's the other one? Um, one is AI. And I think there's another one. Um, so they are all lingering around the edges at the moment. They're all staring us, you know, down and we're, you know, looking them in the face and seeing them as a possibility of existential risk to humanity. Um, I don't think we'll see that in the next 25 years, but some say it possibly could happen in the next 25 then the other option is an enlightened planet. Now that's going to take a lot longer than 25 years as well. Uh, you know, what we're talking about here is the process of reaching a state of consciousness when someone goes from almost zero to, you know, becoming enlightened, it, it takes time. There's a process that we have to go through with. There's a physiological process of purifying the, the physical apparatus to the point where it's aligned enough to the new state of consciousness and there's enough work that has to be involved in getting that state of consciousness purified as well. So we've got a physical and um, intellectual purification that needs to take place and that takes time. And it takes a lot of work as well. So um, I would suggest, you know, we're looking further down the line than five to 25 years, but we're definitely seeing an incredible um, trajectory of both of them moving at the same time where we're seeing huge levels of awakening happening on the planet. You know, hundred million people use the car map, which is phenomenal. It's an app for meditation. We've got podcasts like this happening right now. This is a, an incredible exponential level of growth happening in the level of awareness, the embracing of plant medicines, breath work, meditation, yoga. Uh, but we're also seeing an incredible level of rapid escalation in the 
global risk to human species, the human species as well at the same time. That was pretty much my next question. Do you do you think that um, those two worlds can coexist or it's going to be one or the other? It ends up only ever being one or the other. Okay. Um, so, it, it, but that, that said, uh, one could trigger the other. <laughs> gotcha. Yeah. So enlightenment could save us from, you know, a global uh, threat to humanity. And what that will look like will be that we see uh, it, it will come from ground up, so, which is why it's happening at the moment. The masses are starting to awaken. And as the masses awaken, they have bigger demands on the people that are, I was going to say controlling, but that's not the right word, even though some people like me to use that word, the, the people that are, have got positions of power and authority on the planet right now. So that's mm. political, business, banking, educational, medicinal, or the medical uh, industry. Um, so when we see those people of an awakened state of consciousness, we'll see very different world, but it's going to come from the ground up where people have greater demands and greater expectations on those people. What do you see as the potential structural restructuring for those in a position of power if the world does become more awakened and enlightened? What does that do to the those at the top and potentially, as you were almost were going to say, the control that they might have over the masses? Yeah, it, it will be a very, very different world. And we can go to uh, a wonderful page on Wikipedia called just if people just search Wiki Game B. So we have in Sanskrit a deep and long-standing understanding between the difference of Kali Yuga and Sat Yuga. Kali being the age of ignorance, which is what we're in right now, and Sat Yuga, the age of wisdom or enlightenment, which is what we're moving towards. Um, there's some wonderful people, and Daniel Schmachtenberger, who was in our film, uh, has been putting some new language around this ancient dialogue, which is game A and game B. So game A is a finite game. It's a win-lose game, and it's a game that's self-terminating, and that's the game we're currently playing based upon the systems that are built, and those systems are built by people that aren't in an awakened state of consciousness, which means that they build systems for their own benefit, and they come at a, at a cost to the mass, but to a profit and a benefit to the small. Now, when we're in a state of unity consciousness, we can't build systems that are going to deplete or deprive an extension of ourself. And so when we're in a game B state of consciousness or a Sat Yuga state of consciousness, we start building very, very different systems. We build systems that are going to basically um, uplift and support the whole, that the whole is actually us. And so therefore we can only build a system that supports the whole. And it doesn't um, diminish or deprive um, an aspect of the whole because the whole is us. Mm. So what we'll see is we'll see, and we're starting to see this already, we're starting to see conscious people who are in a state of unity consciousness or, or some degree thereof that are starting to create new systems that are part of a collective. Now in game B, what we have is a win-win game. We have an infinite game and the point of the game is to actually make sure the game can continue to be played okay the point of the game is to play the game and so this is the nature of a state of consciousness that realizes that it's not the end goal it's the process mm -hmm. and that that process has to actually support the whole so we've got a world that's currently not supporting the whole as we can see 0.5 percent or half a percent of you know the world's population known about 95 percent of the world's wealth which is a model we've just normalized to, and we just embrace that model because we don't know anything different. And so we just live and breathe that model and it kind of go off to work and accept that model because we don't know or don't have the power to create anything different. But in Sat Yuga, we're going to see this starting to change where those systems will start to break down. And they're already starting to happen with the development of things like cryptocurrencies, with the development of social media, and all of them still have some traces of a game A world in them, but we're starting to see the it's not like it's just going to go game a to game b it's going to be this gradual transition and we're seeing sort of early prototype versions of what could be possible in a game b world we're seeing people developing new educational systems and people developing new bases of community which is a little bit more communal a little bit more supportive of how to integrate within nature and it's really exciting to see already the early early stages of sat yuga or game b starting to emerge in our society now Based on all of that that you said, which um, gives me great hope and faith, how have you felt over the last, say, two and a half years with the shifting dynamics that have been playing out? What, what's been your overall kind of feeling? Is there ups and downs or have you 
you know, kind of maintained a pretty steady thought process throughout. Be nice to say we're steady all the way through, right? <laughs> <laughs> it's been challenging, I think. Um, it's been challenging, certainly for me. Uh, there's been requirements put upon me and my body that I really struggled with. And um, and what what I could see through all of this was that, of course, it's just there's a classic Bhagavad Gita story playing out here. Bhagavad Gita, one of the greatest books written and, and one of the probably most read books, uh, not in our culture because we have the Bible, but in other cultures, it's hugely popular. And it's the battle of good versus evil or old versus new. And it's a battle that had to play out. And so we, we have glimpses of the Bhagavad Gita playing out. And, you know, in our film, The Portal, another shameless plug here, um, <laughs> there's a beautiful um, analogy by Daniel Schmachtenberger at the back of the book and the film that talks about the metamorphosis or the chrysalis of the caterpillar into the butterfly. And what happens in this caterpillar is literally a Bhagavad Gita story where we see the caterpillar just consuming and gorging and consuming and gorging. And basically the caterpillar is going to eat itself into oblivion if it continues on this trajectory. But what it's doing is it's accumulating these amino acids and it's starting to develop within inside the caterpillar these imaginal cells of the future version of itself. And this is the early, early stages, the early adopters of the caterpillar on its trajectory to becoming a butterfly. Now, because these imaginal cells are a threat to the current status quo in the caterpillar that says, uh, excuse me, but we're a caterpillar and we're staying a caterpillar and you look like trouble. And what the imaginal cells, what happens to them is that the immune system in the caterpillar sees them as a threat to the current status quo and its troops annihilate the new version of what that caterpillar can be. And so they wipe out these imaginal cells. Now in some caterpillars, not all of them, in some caterpillars, the imaginal cells gather momentum and they collaborate, they congregate, they communicate, and they start to grow and grow and grow. And eventually there becomes this tipping point where the imaginal cells overwhelm the resistant immune system in the caterpillar. That's the chrysalis moment. And now there's no turning back. This caterpillar is going to become a butterfly. And when it becomes the butterfly, it now starts to go around the forest, propagating and growing the forest and, and contributing to the well-being of it. So we're, we're not past the chrysalis moment yet. And we're seeing this incredible uprising of consciousness and people starting to challenge the status quo. And then the resistant immune system at the top saying, no, 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 no. If we can take away their rights, if we can suppress more of that information flow, if we can deny them this, then hopefully, because it's really challenging for the people in authority at the moment, because the people have greater capacity to communicate, collaborate and congregate than they've ever had before. Before, if you wanted to get something out into the mainstream media, you had to go onto the radio, magazine, newspaper or TV, which was owned by about three or four different people on the planet. So now you can have a, an app that someone can create in their backyard on their laptop that suddenly has people accessing it all around the world and communicating things. So it's really quite exciting where the ability to move information around the world uh, is starting to happen. It has its polarity and its challenges, of course, but it also has uh, immense capacity to literally bring a new level of awareness to the planet that we've never had before. You've mentioned the portal a couple of times. What exactly is the movie and what was behind the name? Yeah, I kind of still have an issue with the name. It's funny you say oh, that. Oh, I like yeah. it. <laughs> um, so the premise was that I wanted to showcase the power of meditation in a mainstream media way. Uh, I was very inspired by The Secret. They took one of the, they were one of the first transformational new agey type films to come onto the market you know this was before people were doing documentaries that could show through film the power of information and knowledge mm. and they managed to take a very esoteric subject matter the law of attraction and seep it into the mainstream um you know households of the world which was phenomenal and so i got very inspired by that and this was before apps and meditation was you know becoming a global phenomenon and i really wanted to show the power of meditation in helping us transform out of crisis so that was the early stages of that. And so what we wanted to do was rather than have men in lab coats talking about the science of meditation, we wanted to showcase it through storytelling. So we researched over 300 individual stories that had two main components in them. One was that they had some form of crisis and they also used meditation as a mechanism to get through that crisis, to, to break through, through that rashi. And um, so that was the premise of the film and the book, which we extracted from the film. And we also decided to throw in 
three futurists that look at the macro. So we've got the micro, which is individual stories, and then the macro of these three futurists that look at where we've been, where we are, and where we're going as a species. And we even incorporate the, this sort of idea around AI and can AI have the capacity to teach us how to be unconditionally loving, which some people find extremely repulsive and absurd. Yet when we present this, particularly in Q and A's after the film, this idea that humans haven't really mastered the art of unconditional love yet. We haven't quite got there. We still, you know, have religions clashing because they don't like opposing religious viewpoints. We still have political parties and sports teams and even men coming home from the pub and beating up their wives. You know, we haven't quite worked out what unconditional love is. So um, it's, it's, we're a long way from home on that space. And maybe AI has got something co to contribute to us because it doesn't have judgment and it doesn't um, get wasted and it doesn't come home and beat someone up. Well, hopefully it doesn't. And mm -hmm. so um, there's a lot of potential there for AI to be very pure if the coders and, can, and, the, and the programmers of AI are in a state of purity themselves. So this is where we're getting to in the film is that we create what we are. And our primary premise here is we're developing AI technology faster than we're developing our own states of consciousness, which is a bit of a problem. Yeah, I can see that for sure. What, what was behind the name, the portal in the end? Yeah, so the original name was the stillness effect, which looks at the ripple effect of people day by day, person by person, mind by mind, dipping into stillness and how that affects the world around them. But um, I don't know how we ended up with the portal, but we ended up getting there because the portal is the path to transcendence. It's it, the portal is the journey through from one state of consciousness to another and meditation being the portal, not the end goal, but the, the, the pathway through. You've mentioned a couple of times um, state of consciousness and also um, enlightenment. What does that look like for someone who's kind of new to those terms? Because for me, I've been practicing enlightenment for a while and I'm still not hovering just yet, but I'm hoping it's not far away. I think there's degrees. So it's like a light switch that doesn't have um, on and off. It has a dimmer switch. And mm. we can have moments of intense clarity, quietness and embodiment of love and light exuding mm. out of the pores of our skin and we can have times when we can drift back into old patterns and old states of ignorance i think enlightenment when it's stabilized is when there's no retraction when there's no regressing and you'll see people that have fully stabilized these particular states that are unerodible so you do, you no doubt um, like have had glimpses into being an enlightened being. There's no question about it. Mm. And just because the nature of our world, you know, we've got to remember that this is a very new world that we're in now. People that achieve these states because they were so incongruent and so different from the current world status quo, they just simply couldn't coexist within it. And that's why they had to go to an ashram or a monastery mm. and live in the Tibetan Alps or the Spanish Alps or the Italian Alps because they just couldn't coexist in a world that was full of heathens and barbaric existence. But now as the world's becoming more collectively conscious, we can have enlightened people integrating into the households of the world with wives and kids and husbands and working in real estate and working in law or working in a bank. And so we're seeing this very, very early stages of enlightenment seeping into the mainstream collective. Now we don't have a blueprint for what that looks like. And we still have this corrosion and erosion that happens when we might have an incredible plant-based experience or we might go on retreat or we might just come out of meditation and we might walk around for the next three days and this holy moly i feel so much love and the world looks beautiful and my mind's really clear and all i get coming through are just downloads of creativity and wisdom and then we might find this sort of regression or retraction happening because you know you get in an argument with your mom or some financial challenge might appear or something like that but over time, what we'll find is that even those things can't erode that state. And that's what that looks like is that, it, as Julia says in the film, it's not like we become a pushover and everything's just peace, love among beings. You know, um, for instance, you know, I've got children and there might have been times when I had to be quite firm and establish mm. a boundary line. Uh, and I would say, you know, there's a boundary line here and, and this line, it, it shouldn't be crossed. And if it does, then there's some karmic consequences. Now, those karmic consequences, when they have to be enforced, you know, might be some discipline with, with my children. It, might, it was always pre-framed. This is coming from absolute unconditional love. Mm. And I love you so much 
that I, I have to, you know, play this role out and we have to go through this process, but it's only because I deeply love you. And mm. when that's pre-framed, then we can have a world that has boundaries and a world that has communication and we have consequences, but it's always understood that there's a science behind it, a science of evolution. And then mm. that's okay. The, the way that you described enlightenment's um, different to a number of people that I've spoken to about, and I'm still kind of very much a rookie in, in really understanding it on the depths, but a, a lot of people that I've spoken to are like, exactly as you said, it's, it's so rare that it's, um, a fleeting moment of enlightenment or it's the monks that have spent 30 years meditating, you know, up in the kind of Himalayas, whatever it might be that, that experience it. So the way that I'm hearing you speak of it is it can and is integrated more so than, you know, what people are perceiving in today's everyday world. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, mm. most of us, who are doing some degree of spiritual practice have got some degree of enlightenment happening. So you've got to remember, mm. firstly, that enlightenment isn't something that we get. Um, it's like saying, because at the moment, there's, there's grey clouds in the sky outside my window. And mm. it's like saying there's no blue sky there. Well, it actually is blue sky. So there is enlightenment. It's just that there's clouds masking and creating a thick layer of buffer between what I can see is behind that is blue sky, but what I can see is just, is this the, the gray clouds? Mm. So most of us, what we see in a person is the personality, the thoughts, the ego, the, 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 the identity and the emotions and the physicality. But in, in, a, in a more conscious world, what we will start to see, not just of ourself, but of other, will be actually divinity, which is enlightenment. We'll just see the enlightened being mm because N is of and light of light. So enlightenment is that you are of light. It's just that you've got these thick layers of, um, of persona that are impeding the illumination, the radiance of that inner light that comes out from us. And so someone that's enlightened is simply just removed. They've done a lot of work to remove the, the, the clouds that are covering the, the, the radiant sun. And so what will happen is that there will be some days where there'll be no clouds at all. And there's like, oh my goodness, this person is just so conscious and so clear. And then what might happen is some little wispy clouds might come in and just, you can still see the blue sky and you can still see the sun, but there's just a thin layer of impediment. And that's just a little bit of personality might be seeping in. Mm. And so, you know, you look at your Deepak Chopra's and your Eckhart Tolle's and your, um, I'd say Marion Williamson's and your, um, your, your Ajashantis and your Mujis and um, there's, you know, I could rattle off thousands of people that have got this exuberance, this radiance, this luminosity of light, of divinity, of consciousness. But, mm. you know, every now and then you might see a little whisper of a personality just appear and that's just like a thin layer of wispy cloud comes across sometimes. So just so I'm clear on that, enlightenment obviously bypass well bypass is an interesting word but like is beyond any form of ego personality identity persona etc just correct we would say uh, in some terms if we want to use buddhist terms that we'd say they're, they're empty of the ego yes. um, so that the vessel is now so so fullness of being can only happen through emptiness of the ego mm. and so fullness because the ego can never experience fullness. It's only experiencing lack, which is mm. what drives us with ambition and desire mm. is that that's the ego that drives that sense of, I don't have enough or I don't have what I would like to have. Therefore, I'm going to be driven from the egoic sense of lack. But mm. the emptiness that prevails when we're clear of that occupant or that ego is that we get now fullness of being and we can't have that with something that's still occupying the vessel. So there becomes like this liberation. There's a beautiful book called I Hope You Die Soon by Richard Sylvester, um, which really, and Adyashanti's book, The End of Your World, but uh, very much in that non-dualistic type um, sort of philosophy of what enlightenment is, which is uh, very much not experiencing the duality of me and that, me mm. and them, subject and object. And in the Vedic worldview, they don't really talk a lot about non-duality because they sort of cover this perspective of Brahman being the totality, being that there's form and phenomenon, which is true. There is form and phenomenon, but I still think we can have uh, 
a more advanced state to get into, which is unity consciousness, which you, it really is unity consciousness, the seventh state of consciousness in the Vedic worldview is a non-dualistic experience, which is beyond the, um, the egoic identity. You speak about enlightenment as, as beyond the ego and identity. Where, where for you does shadow um, fit into enlightenment? And, and I think you used the term before as mm-hmm. love and light, which I know often yeah. for some people can be a bypass from shadow as well. So where does shadow for you fit into this? So if we take it on a science basis, so if we look at the only thing in our solar system that doesn't have a shadow is the sun because it's the source of light. And so anything that's not the source of light will have a shadow. A beetle will have a shadow. A tree will have a shadow. A cloud will have a shadow. A sun will have a shadow. A moon will have a shadow. You will have a shadow. Your headphones will have a shadow. If you hold that between the sun, which is the source of light, and and something else, you'll see the shadow. That's the, the impediment of the light. Okay. So anything that's not pure light will have a shadow. So the shadow will exist as long as there's some degree of um, something that's not pure light. Mm. But if we remove anything that's not pure light and become pure light, then there's no shadow. Yeah. So divinity doesn't have a shadow. Our ego is, can create a shadow. So our ego can be really good and beautiful and amazing but it still will have a shadow because it's, it's not pure light. It's not pure divinity. Do you find um, with the work as, as people kind of elevating themselves towards a place of enlightenment that, that bypassing can take place in terms of love and light and, and they, there's the bypass of the shadow or, or that side? Do you see that much in your world and do yeah, you have a different the, perspective on it? No, no, there's definitely bypassing that happens. It's almost... Mm. Um, there's a lot of criticism around the idea of bypassing, but mm. there's also a lot of support around it as well. Mm. So it's almost like, so this is what can happen and it's different for everyone. So it's really subjective and it's relative. So I'm sure, I, and I'm open to people opposing this viewpoint, which is totally mm. cool. But a particular journey we could take is that we, we bypass some egoic work and sh- shadow work and inner child work and all that stuff around the ego and tidying up that Thing. We, we bypass that and jump to, oh, I'm experiencing divinity here and I'm experiencing through intense meditation or lots of plant medicine, whatever it is that you use as your vehicle to become source in a non-dual state. And it's like this incredible awakened experience. But then ideally what we want is we do then need to go back and loop back in to tidy up some of the loose ends. Mm. And that's when a little bit of that work not little but some major work needs to happen on so you can do spiritual bypassing i don't think it's a problem as long as we make sure we do that final loop Mm. and go back in and do it's in it's called integral theory integral theory by dustin deperna and ken wilbur and i take a lot of my coaching clients through this idea and on our retreats we cover it in a big session which is that we've got to do the clean up and the grow up because we can do the wake up and the show up but if we don't do the clean up and the grow up and for me that was a big part that was missing in my teaching, particularly in the Vedic worldview, is that it was one thing that wasn't really covered. And I could see that this was causing a lot of problems because there is a little bit of that wake up and show up. But then have you done the final loop there and done a little bit of the clean up, you know, a little bit of like, okay, ah, there's a little bit left undone here. Mm. <laughs> and there's still some little pesky bits of the personality playing out here. Yeah, you've blown my mind. I'm, I'm still kind of taking it as, as I'm processing. I'm trying to process it and, and um, keep things going at the same time. Mate, um, for those that want to find out more of your work, Tom, where, where is the best spot to find you? Uh, probably Instagram is where I'm most active. You know, I find that's a really good platform for just getting little bits and bobs of information out there and people can reach out to me. I do all my messaging so people can message me anytime there. I always respond to my messages. They can go to my website, tomcronin.com or Instagram uh, at Tom Cronin. And they'll find the portal on your website as well, won't they? Yeah, they can find it there or go to the portal website, which is enterthaportal.com. Beautiful. Tom, um, I'll have to listen back to this myself a couple of times just to pick up all, all your nuggets, but I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. Oh, good, mate. It's great to be chatting. Thanks for the time. Cheers. Cheers.